Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is Sunday, September 16, 2018. This is the 7th, 17th Sunday after Pentecost. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508. Our pastor is the Reverend John H. Pollock. Our organist is Greg Nolte, and our choir director is Vicki Perks. St. John's has a food pantry open Wednesdays, 9, 9 a.m. until 1045. We have an outreach store open Monday through Friday, 9.30 to 1, closed on Thursday. Rainbow table is every Friday from noon to 1. Everyone is welcome. Flowers on the chancel stands are from Jerry and Phyllis Cochran in honor of their children and grandchildren's birthday, and from Pastor and Gina Pollock in honor of their sons Joel Pollock's birthday.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
The second reading is from James, third chapter. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes is speaking in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Through, though they are so large that they take strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever will wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And Jesus says for us to deny ourselves. He is not saying for us to withdraw from society so that we will not be tempted because as God created us in the beginning, He created us to be in community. And to be in community means to live with one another, to respect one another, to have a certain set of rules and morals and values that you hold in common. It means to be concerned about one another. And you compare that with the modern day movement of thinking only of the self, not caring about anyone else. This invitation to discipleship, this call to deny ourselves, is telling us to put Jesus in first place is reminding us of where our priorities are. And yet today, as throughout history, the devil of the world constantly trying to push us to putting other things as priorities. Maybe put Jesus way down there somewhere. Fifth, tenth, twentieth. You know, pay attention to him on Sunday when we gather together in the church and then the rest of the week, be like the rest of the world. Make other things your priorities. And if we look around our society today by seeing what's on the news and reading the internet for news, an outsider looking at our nation would say that most people's priorities are one or two things. Sports or politics. Because in the news we see all kinds of stories of passionate responses to sports and politics, but we don't see that same passion for Jesus Christ. If you're a sports fan, you wear jerseys and polo shirts and t-shirts and shorts and workout clothes with your team's logo on it. So everybody knows. Doesn't matter whether you're an NFL fan, major league baseball fan, NBA fan, or a college fan. You want people to know you put speakers on your car. And I see some people driving around with these great big Buckeye helmets on the side of the car or great big Browns helmet or Bengals helmet. Did they ever think how much that's going to damage the car when they will be in there and kill the thing off? And there's that big old stickers in that's still there because the sun faded the paint around it but didn't fade the paint underneath it. But you see that. You see the pack. You see 100,000 people. No matter the weather, go out and watch a four-hour football game. And nobody sits there complaining. I wish uh, they'd heard of this game up. I wish this game would have been so long. They love every minute of it. Sometimes when you're they wish it was still going on. Except maybe if you go to a baseball game and last 17 innings, you probably wish you did shorten up something like But just think. If we as Christians had a passion for Jesus Christ that people have for sports, and if we would be willing to identify ourselves as eagerly as Christians as we do our popular team, our favorite team, it would make amazing changes if we would show that same passion. And the other, as I said, is politics. You see on the news where Somebody's going to speak, and people who have a different opinion grab a whole bunch of people together to go and shout the person down or to cancel the event. When I was in college, we never canceled anybody from speaking on campus. It was, it would advertise the person's coming to speak. If you want to go see him, you went, you didn't. You found something better to do. I mean, went out on a date, or uh, did your homework, or was your current paper, or went down to the
probably thought that when Harry Reid was a Senate Majority Leader and Senator McConnell was a Minority Leader, that the two of them probably hated each other. Because when you would see them on the floor of the Senate, they were always bad at each other. Whatever Harry Reid was for, McConnell was against. Whatever McConnell was for, Harry Reid was against. And then the day came that Harry Reid retired. And the person that gave the most passionate, heartfelt speech about Harry Reid retiring was Mitch McConnell. And he even made the statement that the, as he was talking, he said, you're probably not going to believe this next statement. Both of you in the media especially, and probably a lot of people, maybe even some of my colleagues in the Senate. So that Harry Reid and I are best friends. So we go out together, we dine together, we drink together, we do all kinds of things together. We know what our priority is. It's not our party, it's the good of the nation. And we recognize that we are supposed to be able to debate ideas and then let the public vote and decide. If your priority is Jesus, then you don't get into that mess of people thinking you hate the other person. I remember when I was growing up as a kid, for some reason I had the idea that if in sports, if you were on the opposite team, you couldn't stand the people on the other team. And that all coaches hated each other. And then once I started playing ball, I found that it was the exact opposite. Players are friends with each other. Coaches are friends with each other. Uh, they go out and have dinner together after a game and so forth. If your priority is Jesus, you can think that way. But if your priority is just partisanship, if your priority is just having power, if your priority is just being top dog, then you're going to let the really important things, really important things come through and forget what's done. I remember back in the 80s, someone coming up to me at the praise of Brave was elected president. Oh, the earth's falling. The sky's falling. The world's going to come in. Americans, we know it's going to be no more. We can't stand to have this actor as president. He's going to do all kinds of things. Well, he's eight years went by, and America was still standing. In that eight years, Berlin, the beginning of the bringing down the Berlin Wall and the destruction of the Iron Curtain began. Then Bill Clinton was elected after George Bush served one term, Papa Bush. Somebody came, oh, the world's coming in, and the sky's falling, Clinton elected, Bush should have been re-elected, this is going to be terrible. Well, we went through eight years, Clinton, and we're still here. And our priority needs to be Jesus. Jesus is going to take care of us. Doesn't matter who's elected or whatever. When we trust in Jesus, we can bear anything. And so that's what it means to deny ourselves. Deny those personal petty grudges and petty desires, giving in to the flesh instead of listening to the words. So that's the first challenge of discipleship. The second is a challenge of full surrender. This is when Jesus says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. The cross is about death. The cross was a symbol of death. The cross was one of the most horrible types of execution ever invented by man to inflict on other human beings. Rome used it probably more than any other society because it made fear run through the hearts of a conquered people. So for Jesus to say, take up your cross, probably caused a gasp, a gasp from the crowd. Why in the world would you take up a cross? It's a shameful, humiliating death, excruciatingly painful. And yet, that's what Jesus is telling us to do. So, take up the cross, the word literally means to bear or carry something, which would be obvious, but take up. But as it's used by Jesus in our gospel lesson, it has a much more powerful meaning. And one that we modern day Christians need to hear and to digest and to make part of our life. That is the willingness to bear shame for being a Christian. The willingness to bear shame for being a Christian. I've known of Christians who go when they went to certain places would take off a cross that they wore all the other. Or they take a cross out of the little pill of their jacket. Or they would take off some other kind of jewelry that they would find them. Christian because they didn't want to be put up with any kind of uh, antagonism or animosity from people.
I had my blood pressure nearly went through the top of my head. It was a young pastor who had hadn't been in a parish two or three years and then was moved up to the Senate office, not our Senate, different Senate. And they were carrying on and making fun of pastors wearing the Claire collar at a ball game. Or to the movies, or to the opera, or to the ballet. And that is so stupid to be wearing, why would you wear your collar to a ball game ball? It's like, maybe it's because they think that's a way they can witness to Jesus Christ. And maybe when they're sitting there in that stand and balling, their neighbor or the person next to them or in front of them might ask them about Jesus and why is Jesus so important. Or maybe it's a situation that I ran into throughout the lives of our boys when they were playing sports. I would be busy at the hospital or a meeting or just conducting a funeral. I didn't have time to go home and change it, so I went to the game with my uniform on. And I never had anybody say anything bad. In fact, I had people come up to me and ask me about Jesus. I think I told some of you this story. Maybe it's just my Sunday school class. But our oldest son, Aaron, was a wrestler besides a football player in track. And one night, he had a wrestling meet in East Chicago. Now, East Chicago was in Indiana. It was not in Chicago. They called East Chicago. It was on the Indiana. And it's a pretty rough school. Historically, it's a high school that's produced many famous athletes. Several NBA stars came out of that high school, several uh, NFL stars, some entertainers, and the like. So I had something going on. So I come to the meet in my cleric, dressed in full regalia, and I go to sit up in the bleachers. And one thing I noticed was that all the fathers of the Griffith wrestlers who were Hispanic were standing behind their sons. And I thought that was kind of strange because I'd never seen that before. So I come to them and there was a bunch of Hispanic students. Because Chicago has a large Hispanic population. And while I was watching the wrestling meet, after Aaron won his meet, then you know, I was watching the wrestling meet, but not as closely. And I noticed two big guys come in, Hispanic guys. One had on a black leather coat like in the movies you see the SS wear from World War II. The other guy had a shorter leather jacket on. And I noticed all these kids run up to him and talking to him and stuff. And I noticed them looking at me and uh, sort of looking at me and I just smiled and kind of nodded to him and went back to to watch the meet. When the meet was over, and I'm coming down the uh, bleachers, the man who turned out to be the principal came up to me and he said, Father, there's an eastern, I mean, Northwestern Ohio calls the heavy, or Northwest Indiana calls the heavy Orthodox and the Roman Catholic uh, population, anybody in college is called the Father. So he said, Father, he said, I'm so glad that you're wearing your collar. I said, why is that? He said, you don't realize where you were sitting, do you? I said, why is it? You're sitting among some students. I thought he said, you're sitting right in the midst of the Latin Kings, which is one of the toughest Hispanic games in Chicago and Northwest Indiana. He said, you know those two fellows that came in? He said, that was the local leader and his lieutenant. And he said, it was so good that you nodded and smiled because what they did was give a signal to all those around him to leave him alone. And I thought, he said, they had You'll visit here where we've been hell. He said, they would have made you absolutely miserable if not outright beat you up right there in the stands. So, why does a person who had only been a parish pastor for like two years and gets pushed up in the center was carrying on like that? It was obvious they hadn't been in the parish too long and had situations where you go directly from a funeral or a a meeting or a wedding rehearsal or a hospital visit to a ball game to see your kids play. Or as I say, colleagues of mine who do it purposely so that they can witness. And if it means being ridiculed or taking shame for Jesus Christ, they don't care. Because Christ surrendered himself on the cross for us, therefore we should surrender our lives to him. The third challenge, the 
But the challenge of discipleship is to follow, to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Follow me, Jesus says. That word means to take the same road as someone. It means to uh, take the same road as another, to accompany someone on a journey, to keep on following them, to continuously follow them. It means you never drop off. Just because times get tough. Just because you're in an area where you're a minority and people are making fun of you for being a Christian, you don't give up. You don't quit believing in Jesus. So you continue to accompany Jesus on the trail that he laid out to us. This is part of the reason the season of Lent came about in the church. It came about because of persecution of Christians by non-Christians. Especially during the time that the Muslims were coming up out of North Africa and Turkey trying to conquer all of West, Western and Eastern Europe. And this is why you had the really bad feelings of the Balkans and Bosnia and Herzegovina when Yugoslavia broke up because of the history of the relationship between Muslims. And so what would happen is some Christians would denounce Christ before the Muslim oppressor in order to get along and keep their home and keep the property and so forth. And then the Muslim would be defeated by a Christian army and retreat back into Turkey or North Africa. And some of these people would show up on the doorstep and go back to church. Well, they're a Christian now. And the church thought, this isn't right. You are not willing to be shamed and humiliated for Jesus Christ. You claimed that you weren't following him anymore. And you had it easy. While we suffered under that persecution. And many of us have scars to prove it. So you just can't walk back in here. And so the season of Lent is a time of re-education. A time for the people to re be re-indoctrinated in the Christian faith and to reaffirm the baptism. Not be re-baptized. They've already been baptized. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, St. Paul tells us. But on East, the Eastern Vigil, they would reaffirm the baptism in Jesus, in the faith in Jesus Christ. And on Easter morning, they would be allowed to receive the Eucharist for the first time in that, since that 40 day period. During the church service, during that 40 days of instruction, they were allowed to attend the service up to the sermon. After the sermon, they were escorted out and they had to listen through the windows as the church celebrated the Lord's Supper. Because they were basically excommunicated for having denied the faith. Easter Sunday, they were welcomed back to the Lord's table. So the follow of Christ means continuously to never back off of being a follower of His. How we do this is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it on our own. We do it through the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes it possible. Christ may lead us through some difficult places. He may lead us through as many sorrows as He does joys. He may lead us through as many defeats as victories. He may lead us through as many tragedies as triumphs or more so. But He also gives us His promise. That whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. We may go through it, but the gift of the end is beyond compare. All the trinkets of earth cannot compare with the banquet feast which has no end. All the trinkets of the earth cannot compare to crossing to that far side bank of joy. All the trinkets of the earth cannot compare to going to that land that is fairer than day. All the trinkets of the earth cannot compare being in the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ through all eternity. So accept the challenging invitation to discipleship. Deny ourselves, surrender ourselves, and let us follow Jesus in the good times and in the bad. And receive that glory of eternal life. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Let us now see Redeemed, which is on the back cover of your book. Yeah. 
mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Greater duty 
our joy, which at all times and in all places, give thanks and praise to Almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day both came death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way and an everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and a host of heaven, we praise your name and join in their name.
Mexico. That concludes our 1030 service for this Sunday, September 16th, 2018. We have a 6.30 midweek service on Wednesday in the chapel. Everyone is welcome to attend that. Again, St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508.